I'm a specialist solution architect um, um, covering security and compliance at AWS. Uh, I have a remit that covers Europe, the Middle East and Africa, but in practice that uh, actually means that I spend 90% of my time in London. Um, so it's really nice to get over to the Netherlands. Um, so this is called uh, What's Nearly New, on the grounds that um, it was originally a What's New deck that was uh, put together shortly after our reInvent conference um, at the end of uh, last October. And uh, we have been refreshing it a little bit with interesting security relevant announcements since. So the, the most recent slide in it at the moment dates from last Thursday. It's also perhaps worth knowing that um, along with a uh, bunch of colleagues, um, mostly UK and Ireland based, I've uh, just come here from the back of doing a um, UK security, well, a, a roadshow around the UK, uh, covering security in somewhat more depth than I'm actually going to have time to cover here. Um, but, but we got a couple of those sessions videoed, and all being well, they should be going up on YouTube fairly shortly. So, without further ado, one of the, we've got, been getting a few new certifications recently. I took the ones off um, pertaining to the UK government, to, to UK government specific um, certifications because I wouldn't expect them to be particularly relevant to an audience here. But uh, certainly ones that are relevant are this one, ISO 27018, which um, covers handling of personally identifiable information. Um, this is uh, obviously a fairly paramount one for people are concerned with um, privacy requirements, especially around handling of personally identifiable information outside of a uh, medical records context where there are other, um, where, where there are other standards that uh, tend to cover that data. Uh, Cohen was already mentioning HIPAA in his session earlier. We also have ISO 27017, which is an extension of the standard ISO 27002 control set that people can then go and certify against with ISO 27001. And this is specifically pertaining to handling of, um, well, doing security best practice in a cloud-based cloud environment. Um, there's uh, other things that are coming along from ISO in this regard. There's a version of um, the part four of ISO 27036 is uh, being drafted at the moment. I happen to know the guy who's writing it. And um, that's something that we're keeping an eye on for when it comes out. So, on to a few new security tools. We keep launching services. And there's uh, some nice new security related ones that have uh, come out recently. Cohen's already mentioned um, Trusted Advisor, and he's also mentioned config rules briefly. It's good that he's given a good background onto config as things currently stand. Incidentally, show of hands, config, who's currently using it? Just a few, okay. Well, worth bearing in mind, um, a thing that isn't actually in this slide deck yet, because, well, it isn't actually one of our documents, although we did help work with them on it, the Center for Internet Security have released a new benchmark called AWS Foundations. This is really well worth getting hold of if you haven't already. Who currently uses CIS benchmarks? Show of hands again. Only a few. Okay. Go have, go have a look. Center of Internet Security. Feed it into your favorite search engine. I've been using, and rather a fan of, I will admit, the uh, Linux and Apache um, configura configuration benchmark for years. And I contributed a bit to the Solaris 11 one some moons ago. Um, but but um, it gives you all the details of our recommendations as to how, from a brand new AWS account, to go setting it up so as to give it a decent security configuration. And two things it involves are turning CloudTrail on in all regions and turning config on in all regions. I very much liken them to opposite sides of the same coin. So whereas CloudTrail is kind of syslog for the API, in that you wind up getting all the details of who did what, where and from which when and from which IP address, config gives you the consequences of what those API calls were. So from, um, an, from an AWS asset level perspective, you can think of it as being very much a configuration management database. But anyway, on with these, on with these things. So config rules. Config is an event-driven service. 
So an API call gets issued, CloudTrail typically logs it. Something then changes in, in the configuration and disposition of your AWS assets. That's what config then goes and logs, what that change is. Now, it's an event-driven thing in that you don't get changes logged until changes happen. Lambda is also an event-driven thing. Any, any Lambda fans in the audience? Quite a few more, that's good. So, what we decided to do, I mean, config rules is the name it gets from marketing, but from a technical perspective, it's really Lambda integration for config. So, when a config event happens, not only does config log it, but it allows you to actually set a trigger that can launch a Lambda function of your choice. So, we have some examples here of um, what, well, just an example of what the actual output dashboard looks like. So, you can see a whole bunch of tests being run here, a whole bunch of Lambda functions, some of which have reported fails in that they are coming out uh, stating a non compliance. And you can also wind up graphing them over time here to see how you, your environment um, either stays in compliance or falls a little outside. So what we actually do with this is because you've got the, you've got the power of Lambda back in config now, so you have the ability to write any um, configuration checking function in either Node.js or Java or Python, and you can do some neat things. Um, in particular, there's a session that um, is perhaps worth making note of called Wrangling Security Events in the Cloud from reInvent. And um, two of our senior security engineers, one of whom was uh, fairly instrumental in causing config rules to be, um, they have a play with, these, with, with, a, with a particular Lambda function. So what we've actually done ourselves is we've um, written a small set of, la of example Lambda functions and loaded them up. There's about a dozen of them at the moment. And um, these do things that we expect people would particularly want to be able to look at. So the idea of, um, as Co mentioned already, if someone stands up an EVS volume that isn't encrypted with KMS, it'll send you an alert. Similarly, if someone, if, if someone stands up an EC2 instance that isn't tagged according to your preferred tagging schema, it'll send you an alert. And if someone goes um, putting a rule in a security group that opens a port to the world, it'll send you an alert. But because all this is written in Lambda, I mean, we did this, we, we just defaulted to setting alerts, sending alerts, because it's a harmless thing to do. But you can do some more interesting things. And guys took the function that goes sending you an alert if you see a security group with a uh, rule open to the world, and they said, OK, let's change what it actually does here. And rather than have it just send an alert over SNS as to um, the fact that this rule has come into being, it looks at the rule, it sees that the rule is opening port to the world, it says, I don't like that, I'm going to take the rule away again. And um, if, you, if you have a look at the video, you'll see that they um, go executing the CLI command to add this errant rule to a security group and then they go executing the command to list the rules in the security group. And by the time they list the rules, it's already been taken out by the Lambda function. So you can, it's not quite immutable infrastructure from the point of view of um, root users can still do things to disable that capability. But um, if you don't give someone the privilege to go editing Lambda functions, then it can enforce your network configuration even in the face of people who have privilege to affect it. So that's the API automation aspect there as well. Um, we have a bunch of partners, including Splunk, who are using um, config and config rules. Splunk can ingest config rules data and give you a whole bunch of information on it, as uh, you'll have seen from the graph in the last presentation. And um, it gives you continuous monitoring, um, we actually have continuous monitoring certification as part of our FedRAMP medium. Um, so that's a thing worth knowing about. Cohen's already said that we run all our regions worldwide exactly the same in as much as we can um, relating to um, local controls. For instance, in the EU, we're only able to keep our data center CCTV footage for 30 days compared to the 90 that we normally do. 
but it's we only take these small differences on board where we absolutely need to. Uh, one thing that we've done, and this is a slide from last Thursday actually, I mentioned that we've produced our own sort of little small repository of example config rules functions written in Lambda. We've now decided to open source the whole thing. So this is a screenshot of the GitHub repo, where, um, which is now our new config rules repository. And people are welcome and indeed thoroughly encouraged to write Lambda functions, to do neat things, post them up there, and let us know about them that way. And um, obviously it's a, uh, it's a framework for doing powerful things. Let's have fun with it. Um, now, this is something that has uh, changed its name a little bit over the course of the last couple of months, so I may wind up using some old terminology here. Um, as as Karen said earlier, we have a whole bunch of third-party certifications for what goes on and what we do on our side of the demarcation line of the shared responsibility model. Um, when, if you want to build a compliance stack, uh, let's say you are subject to uh, PCI DSS controls yourself as part of your business, then you still need to get assurance and, certain, and approval from your own auditors about what you build on top of us and how you go about operating it. So, um, essentially, if you, um, are PC, if, if you need PCI DSS compliance, you will still need to get your QSA in, you will still need to convince your QSA of the appropriate nature of the environment you're running on top of us and how you maintain it, and then you will show them a copy of the PCI DSS full report that you're able to get from us under NDA, along with our SOC 1 and SOC 2 reports. Um, I do recommend, actually, even if you're not involved in payment card processing, that you do get copies of all three, um, because um, PC, the, our PCI DSS report doesn't just cover things pertinent to credit card processing. It gives a bunch of information about um, how we go about assisting you in the event of there being a need for forensic examinations, for instance, and investigations. Also, it uh, covers details of the uh, separation assurance of different guests on top of our hypervisor. So if you need any of our third-party audit reports available under NDA, I highly recommend getting all three. But anyway, I digress. So where am I? Ah, yes. So if you um, get your QSA in, um, you would need to, as well as um, showing them that you're operating your part of the environment correctly, you would then show them our audit report done by, um, done by Cold Fire in the US um, for um, PCI. Um, interestingly, for ISO 27000, well, all our ISO certifications, plus our SOC audits, we actually get them done by Ernst & Young Certified Point right here in the Netherlands. And uh, you can download our reports, uh, the public certificates for ISO 27001, and it'll actually show that. But you'll show your auditor our reports, and then an enlightened and pragmatic auditor will say, I'm happy with what's on top of the stack. This audit report shows me that a, um, an auditor of good standing is happy with what's going on below the stack. Um, this causes me to be happy enough to sign off the whole stack as being compliant. So, but because we take a very Unix philosophy um, to the way in which we offer our services, that is, we trust you to know more about your business and its requirements than we do, um, you are still able to build things on top of our stack, on top of our environment, that won't be compliant. And we know that compliance is a fairly hard thing to achieve, because um, we have auditors in pretty much all the time, bearing in mind how many data centers we have worldwide. So, we've released a set of assets. Um, it was originally under the code name of Goldbase, and uh, that name still survives in um, a couple of the white papers that exist. But we, we're working to, well, we've, we've put together a CloudFormation template framework, um, a schema that you're able to then go actually just inserting snippets of code into to build bits of environment, so things like VPCs with um, 
specific subnetting and specific um, network access control lists, which we would expect that if you deploy those as part of your environment on top of our services, will help get you closer to something that's going to be compliant. We released our first set that covers NIST 853 back in January. Um, we started with that one primarily because of uh, frequency and volume of requests for it from our friends over the pond, but also because NIST 853, if you've uh, actually read it, it's a really seriously big control set. And we figured that if we cracked this one first, then a lot of it would be readily reusable in uh, subsequent standards. So, as you can see, we have plans to do a whole bunch of um, other asset sets for other different standards. PCI is the next one, although I admit I don't know uh, when it's actually going to be coming time frame wise. And, um, these ultimately are just elements of CloudFormation templates that you can pick up and deploy yourselves. Now, on to Inspector. Um, anyone here had a play with Inspector yet? Just the one, okay. Well, Inspector's something actually quite close to my heart, bearing in mind my own history of uh, what, I've, what I've been doing back in traditional data center worlds, hardening operating system environments. Um, as I said, I'm a big fan of the CIS benchmarks, and elements of that are incorporated in what Inspector is going to be doing for you. But um, let's start at the beginning. Back when I were a lad, if I wanted to um, go hardening a Linux instance down, I would download something like Bastille or Titan or one of those tools. Great big monolithic lump of shell script. And I'd go and run that, and it would go, it would go through, and it would touch and tweak um, file ownerships, file permissions, maybe bits of file contents, and it would pop out the end and say, effectively, done, you are secure, <coughs> were it ever that simple. Um, so that was kind of generation one of tooling. Generation two, things got a lot more modular, whereas instead of having one great big shell script, you had a whole ton of little shell scripts, each of, which, each of which did one specific thing. So doing something like ensuring that um, ICMP echo requests, that, re that requested timestamps, didn't get the timestamp. And you got that, um, and, and you then had this library of scripts, and you would write an extra marshalling script that would run all these little scripts in the order that you wanted them to. Sometimes, and you could even actually run these things in an audit mode, whereby instead of actually changing your, the configuration of your system, you just wind up getting a, a, a note out to the effect of whether your system was already configured right. So you could actually get a report out rather than just saying, done. Um, so that was kind of generation two. Um, I particularly remember the Solaris Security Toolkit being something that did that. Generation three made it portable and you got things like OpenSCAP. I'm still a big fan, fan of OpenSCAP for live service environments. Other people here using it on Linux? Just the one? Okay, worth looking at again. Um, when, uh, You've got much the same design principles, but there everything gets expressed in XML-based languages, so you've got Oval for writing your tests in, and rather than just writing a master shell script to marshal all your tests in shell, or batch or whatever, you have a thing called XCCDF that you do it in. You can then go fire it out to all of your fleet, get, get reports back in XML, XSLT, XSLT them into HTML, and throw them into some sort of status tool, and uh, there you go. <laughs> Now you've got Inspector. The thing about all these previous three generations is that when you go having your script or scripts assess the configuration of your systems, they're a point, they do so at a point in time. So you just run your test, it executes for the few milliseconds it executes, then it exits with a status report. Now, what Inspector does that's different is it's actually very much more a spread over time assessment. Currently, um, Inspector is something that we um, have designed for use in development and test environments. The idea is that, um, well, the intention is that you integrate it into your, um, conti into your um, continuous integration pipeline after you've gone and done your static code analysis. Because as we all learned from uh, the recent OpenSSL issues, 
static code analysis doesn't necess isn't necessarily guaranteed to catch everything, especially if you've got a big, complicated pile of code. So the idea with Inspector is that you actually run it um, against your own test highs. I mean, we hope you're all writing test-driven code in that you first write the spec of what you want to do, then you write the test harness for it, then you write the code that fulfills the requirements of the test harness. So what happens with Inspector is it's actually a Linux package. Um, currently there's support for Amazon Linux and Ubuntu. Um, support for more platforms is coming because it's only in um, essentially preview at the moment. And so you do your standard yum install, um, again, start on your instance, and you then run the um, agent that results. The agent comes in two parts. You've got um, an HTTPS sender that uh, sends a stream of telemetry out through um, either a NAT gateway or ideally um, something like um, a web proxy. Um, I favor Squid, others are available, but we're using Squid 20 years and it holds up very nicely. Um, in order to go out, in order to send traffic out to the inspector endpoints, which like um, all, um, all, all standard AWS endpoints are internet facing. I, I haven't mentioned the uh, S3 private endpoint deliberately there, although that's another new thing. The second part of um, the inspector package is a kernel module. So why a kernel module? What's it doing here? Well, we actually interpose on a whole bunch of standard function calls. So um, if there's an instance where things like opens and writes and stats and so forth happen, <coughs> then we actually watch those, we track them, we report on them. And uh, the reasoning for this is that the case could well happen in your code if you have a particularly subtle bug where your, your code, has, during the course of its execution, goes opening up some security hole and then closing it again. So with any of the previous three generations of tooling, Unless you happen to be running the test that would pick the hole up at the precise sort of within the few milliseconds window where the test may, where the vulnerability may be limited, um, you wouldn't actually see it. Inspector catches this, and um, there's a video from reInvent um, up on YouTube. Um, YouTube's a nice service um, where. Um, yeah, Alex Lucas, who uh, heads up the uh, Inspector um, development program, actually talks through all this and does a demo. Uh, the demo starts um, just under half an hour in, and in it, Alex actually um, just runs a little Python script up that um, temporarily chmods a root-owned file to 777, and Inspector picks it straight up. And Alex's Python script chimulted it back again after about two milliseconds, but the inspector still catches it. So what um, inspector actually understands at the moment in the preview version is all of this. So standard uh, MITRE CVE vulnerability database, um, our own views on best practices, which are kind of a superset of uh, what CIS would give you in um, their benchmark documents. And we also have some elements of um, <laughs> compliance tests for PCI DSS. For production, um, for various reasons, the PCI testing is going to be going away. And we're actually going to add in instead <coughs> the formal CIS benchmark tests. So um, this is for Linux and various other things. So when you go running Inspector, you get a bunch of findings out, uh, which get prioritized. Um, they give you a context of um, the application um, that they are happening in, uh, the nature of the um, assessment that's being done, the rule package where the test lies, and the finding details. And um, if the output of all this looks like, whoops, looks like um, a um, CVE report, that's entirely unsurprising. And um, obviously you get uh, helpful remediation notes down there at the bottom. So as I said, um, Inspector, because it has a kernel module in it, it does have a bit of performance overhead on your system. 
Um, we Obviously, this is going to vary depending on um, the nature of the code that you're testing. We would reckon single digits of percent CPU. Um, right now, we're, we're humming and hawing a little bit. We still think Inspector is primarily intended for a dev test environment. So when you actually run your agent up, you can set it to run for between 5 minutes and 24 hours, depending on how long you expect your, um, a test cycle of your code to take and uh, after that it will stop. Uh, we are not recommend it for re recommending it for production deployments yet. Um, if you want to go doing um, more traditional sort of generation three um, testing in your actual production environments for configuration changes that fall outside of your security requirements, then uh, yeah, I'll stick my hand up and say I have to be an OpenSCAP fan, but of course other tools are available. So on to WAF, um, we have gone and built ourselves a web application firewall and we've put it in CloudFront. Um, it's a fairly simple WAF at the moment, it can do a couple more things now than just um, string matching and SQL injection, injection checking, it can also alert and potentially block based on um, things like access frequency in particular is uh, one that we've gone and um, built, built in recently. So you can, uh, you can write yourself rules for it, um, up to 10 of those per deployment, and as I said, it lives in CloudFront, so you can, through CloudFront, have this applied globally across your environments. Um, it does what a WAF does. Um, it has the standard uh, yeah, it basically has the same design requirements as any other kind of WAF. And we have some interesting things going on with partners pertaining to it. In particular, um, it's, as I said, it's a fairly simple WAF at this point in time, although um, the WAF team are adding to it. If you take a rather more sophisticated WAF from the likes of Imperva that has um, rather more interesting and detailed filtering capabilities and identifying capabilities. Um, what they can do now is they can, on the fly, write a rule for our WAF and actually push that rule out when they spot um, a pattern that pertains to what they consider to be bad traffic. Now, the reason why I want to do this is um, our WAF sits out in CloudFront, so very much um, out on the internet side of um, where you go deploying a WAF appliance in your VPC, for example. And um, it's actually worth, well, it makes common sense, but um, it's worth knowing, and we actually have intellectual property on this, that um, it's, far, it's far easier and far more effective, if you've got the infrastructure to do it, to try stopping badness as close to the attacker as you can, rather than dealing with it once it gets aggregated into larger volumes and hitting you. Similarly, um, our WAF, like many other AWS services, is designed to scale and scale really quite hard and large. Whereas um, an, Imperva, um, an Imperva instance, um, you can deploy it on a big box, sure, but um, it's still an instance. So this means that um, the likes of uh, instances from these vendors can actually use our WAF to take the load of blocking off of themselves and farm that, uh, farm that sort of brute force load off to something that scales the way our WAF does. As to when, um, we actually launched this um, at the Berlin Summit, um, summer of last year. Um, there's uh, been considerable interest in it, um, particularly from the academic community, and um, well, they've been all over it from the point of view of doing active academic cryptanalysis and writing uh, research papers. There's a couple of them being posted on um, our security blog, by the way, which are well worth a read if you're into this kind of thing. Um, incidentally, um, our security blog happens to be probably the place where um, security announcements about what we're doing um, happen um, closest to the actual events. So it's a great thing to watch um, from the point of view of uh, news of what's going on in AWS security. I hope everyone takes an RSS feed of it. Please do so. Great way to stay informed. 
But anyway, as to when. Now, while um, OpenSSL still has a whole bunch of virtues and we still like it in a lot of ways, um, certain events in the last couple of years have shown that um, a code base of that size and um, that age in a lot of cases can be very hard to analyze for actual security issues. Um, after Heartbleed, Coverity actually did a very good posting on um, how they've gone and modified um, their C um, static code analysis tools to go picking up on some of the issues that um, Heartbleed raised. But um, go have a read. It's, um, it, it shows just how complicated some of this stuff can get. So what we decided to do was uh, take a particular piece of um, OpenSSL that we are still very much fond of, being libcrypto, and we wrote a very minimal implementation of the TLS 1.2 protocol, and that is S2N. Stands for signal to noise, being a play on words about how the output of a decent Feistel cipher is going to be statistically indistinguishable from wire noise. Um, so, and we managed to do that in a mere 6,000 lines. Um, as I said, the, uh, the academia has uh, been all over it, particularly with uh, issues of um, side channel and timing attacks, looking for things like those. And uh, fortunately, um, our code actually manages to deal with that. But the code itself, we've open sourced it. It's up on GitHub. Uh, we use it, we are in the process of actually moving all our API endpoints to using it. So if you have a need for a small, performant, secure TLS 1.2 stack, by all means grab it, use it, make use of it. Um, and if you happen to like it or if there's anything, you, anything further that you think could be done better in it, please let us know. <coughs> So VPC flow logs, uh, Cohen's already mentioned these a little bit. Um, a thing about these, people have uh, been sort of ruminating and asking us for a little while now. The thing about security groups is okay, they really are under the lid a proper layer three stateful inspection firewall, but people have been wanting to get logs out of them. And also, of course, you can't currently um, set up a span port in the VPC layer 2 network and go diverting all your traffic off to a snort farm or something like that. So the question comes as to how do you go about getting logs out of your VPC traffic. And this is, in fact, how you do it. So we went and built ourselves another hypervisor module. And so we are now actually able to take uh, feeds from both the actual ENI's network interfaces in the instances, details out of security groups themselves, details out of our network access control lists, and aggregate those into sets of flows. Now, what actually goes on here, the output that you get you don't wind up getting um, a log record per packet, because if you did, um, we'd be profiting an awful lot from, it, from the S3 storage of it. Um, I mean, there's, if, if you haven't seen it already, there's a cool video um, that uh, Eric Brandwine, one of the designers of VPC, um, did. Again, it's another reInvent one. There's two of them actually. One's called the day in the life of a billion packets. The second one is called another day, another billion packets. Um, it, watch the second one as there's some repetition in it from the first one. But uh, what Eric wasn't allowed to say at reInvent when he gave the first one is that rather than a day, a billion packets represented about three seconds of traffic across AWS at the time. But anyway, so, so what you wind up getting out of your flow logs is something very S-flow like. Um, so we have quantized time windows that we gather packet information in. Um, these are the time window bits of information over here in terms of start and end time. And uh, we then make these records available um, based on tuples of your source and destination, IP addresses, and port numbers. 
So if you were looking at a um, stateful protocol in this context, you would consider this to be part of a session. Um, now the neat thing about these is that um, if you've got your security groups and network access control lists nice and tightly locked down the way that you want them to be in production, this means that you, anything that you get and a normal operation will have this accept flag on the end. If you ever get a deny in that context, that's, in, that's an indication that some packet flow is trying to get to or from somewhere that it shouldn't be. So this is a data flow that, or an attempted data flow that is immediately of interest. And people have been building lightweight kind of network intrusion detection systems just doing um, simple string matching on, on um, VPC flow log records and denies um, using just using um, just just using CloudWatch logs. But of course, Splunk can now inhale this, so you can feed this into Splunk and set it up to do just the same thing. And the final piece for this is our newest service, AWS Certificate Manager. Has anyone had a play with this so far? Quite a few, quite a few. This is good. So, long-term and eagle-eyed AWS watchers will uh, not have added to escape them that over the course of the last year or so, we've been doing a whole bunch of work that has resulted in us becoming a global root CA. So, what we can now do as a result of this is actually provision um, certificates, both regular static and wildcard, um, into um, ELBs and CloudFront distributions. The other thing that we do is because we're managing these certificates and key pairs, um, we automatically renew any certificate that is coming up for expiry, typically about a month before it does. So never have a certificate unexpectedly expire on you again. Um, we actually manage the registration of these just using email, so when you actually go requesting a certificate, uh, we will email you um, to an address in the domain you're requesting the certificate for, and you then um, wind up clicking on a link in order to uh, essentially say, I have successfully received this email, therefore that is, a, that is an assertion of ownership of the domain. So, um, we, so we're only doing domain validation by email, we're not doing extended validation, if that's something that's important to you at this point. It's available through all the usual mechanisms, and it's free. So, no more paying for keys. Um, I was actually on the beta program for this, and I, I managed to get it um, up and working, and got my first certificate minted in about 10 minutes. Um, in all honesty, the hardest thing was standing on the mail server on the domain in order to be able to receive the email, because I just built myself a scratch domain for this. <laughs> and um, we just look after the keys. Um, it's only actually available in US East at the moment, and uh, certainly the, big, the, the most frequent request we get from customers is when is this going to be available in uh, other regions. Um, for CloudFront, incidentally, if you're using CloudFront globally or in any, um, in any CloudFront area subset that includes the US, this does actually work globally. Um, but obviously, um, it's a very new venture for us, a new kind of service. So before we go making it available worldwide, we just want to be absolutely sure how it performs and how it behaves from the point of view of how we need to scale it in the, in, in the um, case of uh, large peaks of requests. So uh, please bear with us while we shake it out to make sure that it's all working exactly as it needs to be before we say it's ready for, it's completely ready for prime time. Um, obviously, um, while it isn't explicitly in scope yet, um, because of the way we do our audit cycles um, for any of our um, certifications, don't be at all surprised if it winds up getting that way. Typically, 
Um, we do our PCI audits annually. Um, new PCI reports come out typically about September-ish. Um, SOC audits get done twice a year, so they typically come out um, end of October, start of November, and end of, end of April, start of May. So sometimes things need to be up and running before we can, for six months before we can even enter them for audit. So it can be up to a year between a service being introduced and it actually getting into scope for an audit. But um, the, the certificates issued, because we do the maths properly, um, can be used in contexts where you need to meet these particular compliance requirements. So, as you can see at the bottom, we're doing the maths properly with RSA 2048 and SHA 256. We do wildcards. You can have multiple domain names in the same cert using SNI, um, up to 10 per cert. And we look after the management of them. And finally, um, we've been uh, introducing some more um, certification and training for security. So, we've got new security fundamentals training, that's a three hour course um, for auditors and analysts. Um, we also have a three day training, three day classroom based training course for security on AWS and certifications part of all AWS exams. A final thing for this session is that um, to celebrate our 10th anniversary, we have also gone and um, we've also gone and actually made all the Quick Labs certificate training courses. People view people here using Quick Labs, quite a few. Okay, QWIK Labs. We've gone and made all all the Quick Labs courses free until the end of the month. So um, you haven't got too long, but. Uh, <laughs> We, we, honestly, we did announce it on the 14th, which was our 10th anniversary. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's really neat that AWS's anniversary has to be on Pi Day. Um, but, um, but, yeah, so get your skates on. They are free till the end of the month. And so, on to my next deck, please, gents. Now, you don't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> So I have another deck to uh, whip through fairly quickly, um, as well as the, well, the CIS benchmark for AWS Fundamentals focuses on the security techniques and tools you can use to get yourself a decent security baseline in an individual AWS account. But there's a whole bunch of interesting things that you can do for multi-account environments. So, I've already mentioned the benchmark, that's the blog posting that announces it. Um, the one thing it doesn't actually cover is uh, detailed billing. Turning that on is also a good thing to do. Um, but um, I did some work um, a few months ago with uh, a friend who's Russian. And um, obviously he has been uh, tracking quite carefully what's been going on over there regarding um, issues of uh, data sovereignty and export of personally identifiable information. So we did a little, a little exercise together about how you, you go about taking as much personally identifiable information out of AWS as you could. And um, one way in which you actually do that ties in with another element of our recommended practice. So when you, go, when you go standing up an AWS account, you, you open it by using an email address. Rather than actually using your own email address or any other individuals, we recommend that you actually do this to a mail alias that goes to multiple people. Because in the event of us needing to contact you for whatever reason, we, obviously it's best if we um, are, have assurance that we're going to reach somebody who happens to be in the office or otherwise on duty rather than an account owner who may have left the company in extremis or may be on holiday or you get the idea. Similarly, um, the phone contact details that you give us, ideally that should go to a PABX hunt group rather than someone's mobile for exactly the same reasons. Now that has the useful side effect of actually removing personally identifiable information from the account registration system because these details, as they don't uniquely identify an individual, aren't PII. Kind of neat. 
Um, obviously, if you also set things up with your account manager so that you get billed by invoice rather than on a credit card, that takes PII out of the billing system if you just send things to your company name. On to some neat things about S3. Um, Kevin has uh, briefly mentioned Glacier Vault Lock, um, which we have uh, had, well, we, we built it in order to meet the requirements of uh, some of our friends over the pond in financial services. And we also got a company called Cohasset Associates to, uh, who've been doing a lot of audit work for the SEC over the last 40 years, have a careful look at it. And their view is that a vault block glacier actually meets the requirements of SEC books and records, um, <coughs> audit and compliance requirements, along with a few other FINRA regulations as well. So it's well worth a look. Over, um, back in the UK, there's the usual um, there's a requirement that you um, keep hold of uh, financial transactions for your business for seven years. Um, Glacier Vault Box is a great way to do that. And it also happens to really be our first mandatory access control system in that once you've got a Vault Lock on your Glacier Vault, even root in the AWS account can't go deleting it or deleting records from it. So that's an important consideration to bear in mind. Anyway, back to S3 briefly. So, I see there's uh, a bunch of um, fellow geeks of a certain age in the audience. Who here has, or will admit to, in their youth at university, whatever, banging on a vax? Some old vax hackers in the room. <laughs> Good to see you, Joe. Good to see you, folks. Uh, I like to think there were some old vax hackers who also came up with S3 versioning in that um, what you have, back in VMS days, if you created a file and saved it, and then edited it and saved, another, and saved it again, you'd actually wind up getting two copies. So you'd have file name semicolon version number, but um, the version number was normally hidden and you had to use some extra switches on LS in order to go displaying them. S3 does the same thing except instead of semicolon version number, you get great big machine generated string. And again, normally you only see the latest version of your file, although you can use some extra switches on LS to get visibility of them all. Um, VMS also had the purge command, which when you ran it, um, deleted all the versions older than, your, older than the latest one of your file. Now, with MFA delete, you have the ability in S3 to essentially take away the purge command, or at least ensure that you need to use an MFA token. Now, I'm not going to reach into my pocket and get mine out, as there happens to be a radio mic um, endpoint in there now. Um, but well, we all know we all know what um, two-factor authentication tokens look like, right? Little little LCD little LCD screen with a button on one end. Um, so you can set things up so that you need to use MFA authentication um, on an S3 bucket in order to delete stuff. So if you go then taking that token and either giving it to someone else or locking it in a safe, then so, so that you're not able to um, enable MFA, um, then you start having something that looks a lot like an append-only file system. And this, as well as being able using S3 lifecycle rules to go rotating things into Glacier, gives you something that looks very interesting from an evidential perspective. Though I'm not a lawyer, I've worked with a few, and I've also uh, had fun um, gathering evidence for forensics gigs before now. So if you take all your logs, these being most of the logs that um, AWS can emit for you, and um, as was said earlier um, by both Cohen and the uh, Splunk guys, I like the idea of having a system where I can fairly readily implement my favorite kind of log policy, which is if it moves, log it. If it doesn't move, watch it till it does, then log it. Um, and you can make these logs actually be write only using this capability for, uh, for S3. Obviously, we, some of us may remember the joke about write-only memory being a famous April Fool's data sheet. Someone still needs to be able to read these logs. That would be something for your auditors. So, you can actually, with S3, 
set things up so that uh, S3 buckets can be shared cross account. And because of the fine granularity of IAM permissions in S3, I like an IAM to being very much um, Linux role-based access control writ large. Um, you can actually share an S3 bucket write only rather than read only. So this means that from the point of view of the account generator over there on the right, they have this black hole that they're firing logs into. They can't actually see anything once it's written into the log bucket. They can't, so they can't read log files, they can't list log files. And because it's cross account, even the root owner over there on the right, even the root user, can't get information about what the policy is on that bucket. And having spent um, far too long before joining AWS, um, doing um, trusted Solaris systems, dealing with, dealing with modified Bell Lapadula mandatory access, um, multi-sensitivity and multi-domain systems, this, in my view, is mandatory access control. Now, when I was writing this slide, I had the realization that slides are not the best medium for conveying large tracts of JSON. So instead, in, in terms of actually showing the bucket policy, so instead, I decided to show the process I went through when creating my policy. There's a really, really, there's a really useful blog posting that a uh, very helpful colleague wrote about how to go about doing um, CloudTrail cross-account. I started there. I added a few more bits in terms of the explicit permissions needed from the config um, developer guide as to what config needed to do this. And then I added S3 get bucket location so that I could actually ensure that when doing this across all regions worldwide, I was still able to have everything land in the one S3 bucket in my preferred home location, which happens to be our Dublin region. Sorry about the eye chart here. These slides will be made available afterwards. I then added this piece of CloudWatch logs. The salient bit is that I'm just adding um, put object and get, bu get bucket location there. Um, final piece of this, well, penultimate actually, piece of this jigsaw <coughs> is obviously my audit users need to be able to read this and that blog posting gives a set of permissions as to how to go about doing that again. And the real final piece of the jigsaw is because we're doing things cross account and therefore both accounts need to have permission to either share or to access, this is the little bit of IAM policy that you need to have in the accounts that are generating the logs that are going into your cross account bucket. Now, a bit of a truth hidden in plain sight is um, there's another source of log data that we don't actually talk about that much, and that's detailed billing. So anytime you do something that incurs a cost, um, a record goes in your detailed billing log. I mean, we want to get paid, right? Um, so this can actually, you can actually use this if you like as checks and balances against your cloud trail and config records. The other neat thing is because you can consolidate these cross account, they are globally, they're globally applicable cross region anyway, it actually makes for a nice first source of information to go to to see if there's anything going on in your account that perhaps shouldn't be. So um, again, this is something that um, security incidents in event management and monitoring systems like Splunk can inhale. So if you put all this together, you get something really rather interesting. And this is a piece of work mostly done by um, my friend and colleague Bertram Dorn, based in Germany. I just added a little extra tweak on the end. So, how to go about setting an account up? The CIS benchmark um, does most of our work for us here, but um, a thing that Bertram and I agree on is that when it comes to actually setting up accounts that um, do the job of root without being root, it's best to have two of them. So we've got our, our IAM master account here, which is able to create, um, create roles and uh, permission sets, but not go assigning them. And an IAM manager role here, 
that is able to assign them but not create them. So immediately you have a two-person rule here. These people need to collaborate in order for a, another user to wind up getting a permission. And this means that you don't have a single user who is omnipotent across IAM, because then one of the things they could easily do would be just rewrite themselves root. Now let's zoom out and consider a multi-account structure. Um, so this is something that's good for an enterprise. Start with a billing account. You've got an S3 bucket, shared cross-account as previously described. There's nothing else in there, and the only time it should be logged into is when that bucket needs to be shared with a new account that you've created for your organization. You then have a logging account, which aggregates all your log data as previously described. You set the you set the logging from your billing account to point to your logging account, and you set the billing for your logging account to point to your billing account. Some people like to have a separate account that just holds IAM users, so the users you've got who um, have permission to go making API calls. This, incidentally, is a reference architecture. It is not prescriptive. You don't have to implement all the parts of it. Just take the pieces away that you think are applicable to your organization. Now, so you've got your IAM users here. We've got a gap here, so we're actually federating these. Um, some, people, some people use Active Directory. I'm a Unix guy. I happen to favor OpenLDAP with a, with, with a shibboleth front end to do the uh, SAML2 brokerage. Other, other LDAP services are available. Um, the neat thing about doing this is it's a means of getting even more PII out of IAM if you need to but also you can actually federate from multiple accounts into the same identity repository. So if you need to keep your users consistent across multiple accounts, federation is a neat way to do it. Anyway, so each of, these, each of these users has one permission and one permission only, and that's the ability to assume a role. So literally, that is their I am policy. Reasoning for this, we've obviously here we set our logging and our billing up, is that we have a bunch of roles in our resource accounts that our users then go assuming cross account. So we set our logging and our billing up on our resource account. These are the accounts that actually hold our assets and do useful stuff. So our users go using STS credentials, ephemeral access keys and secret access keys that are issued by our security token service to go, to go accessing these roles cross account in order to do the things they need to build and maintain your system. You have a bunch of these. Um, there's good reasons to. You, how, you, how many you have is entirely up to you. Accounts are not a scarce resource. They're actually free to configure and own. You just need to put a bit of intellectual capital and time into maintaining them. And there's a uh, large organization um, that I work with in particular over here. Um, which, um, it's, a, it's a global manufacturer, so you'd expect them to have a few AWS accounts. They actually have in excess of 20,000 AWS accounts, and they manage them. So, multi-account architectures, they take a bit of building, but you can do it. So, obviously, you set your billing and your logging up here. Some people want to have a backup account. Um, in order to uh, actually hold backups um, of their database snapshots, for example, you'd have a different bucket policy on that because you'd need to be able to both read and write from a given account, but you'd want to constrain things by the prefix on the key in, of the uh, file name. So you've got backup traffic there, and the not quite final piece of the jigsaw is an audit account where you would go running your AWS hosted instances of Splunk um, in order for your auditors to go do an analysis of all the traffic, that, all, all the information they're able to read from everywhere. Now, that's an account for your internal auditor. Why only have, why only have that one? I mean, we get, ex, we get audited externally by Ernst & Young and Coldfire and others all the time, so why not have another account just like that that you offer to your external auditor so they can get, near real time, ability to consume your log data? Interesting thought, isn't it? Also, if I'm going to be a bit more mischievous, how about if you're in a highly regulated industry, actually offering your regulator an account like that? I'll leave that one hanging. Um, final piece of the jigsaw for this is we've got our backup account, 
but how about actually then making it hold more than just our backups? Anyone using Service Catalog? Only me. Okay, there is one. Well, it's a service that probably needs more love. Unfortunately, I'm just about out of time, but um, we, can, we can talk about it afterwards if you like, or as I said, um, there's a uh, video version of a longer version of this talk where I go into more detail on it. But you could actually make this essentially the minimal thing that if you want to go having a multi-region environment for disaster recovery, the contents of your service catalog account, being CloudFormation templates and golden AMIs that you use to build your AWS world, plus your database snapshots, that would give you the perfect little lifeboat, if you will, of what you could go copying cross-region and then creating, recreating the entirety of your AWS universe in the event of a civil contingencies level disaster affecting the whole of your home AWS region. So this piece of work is now also pretty much covered by the CIS benchmark, um, being what being unnatural events, if you will, that would be indicative of, uh, secu of um, security um, issues, potential compromise that you'd want to actually go raising alerts on um, through something like SNS, and you wind up actually having um, your alerting <coughs> flow look like this from your log sources over here, through some analysis here, but uh, here, of course, is where you're putting your Splunk environment. Um, then going out to SNS to the whole bunch of notification mechanisms that it, it, it offers. CloudTrail currently has a latency on it from event to log record of between five and 15 minutes. We're working on speeding that up. But for all these other ones, you're talking no more than seconds to get from event to notification. That's even something arriving on your mobile phone. Um, draining the PII, I've already mentioned. That white paper's worth a look. It's a nice white walkthrough of how you do the OML, that and shibboleth thing. And that's me. <laughs>